Isn't this exciting? Yeah. Where are you from? Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, we are on. Good morning, everybody. Day three of the Inclusion Collaborative 2018 State Conference. How many of you been here all three days? Oh my gosh, you virtual people. How about you, all three days? Woo, we have a virtual audience here. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kathy Wall. I'm the director of the Inclusion Collaborative, and for some reason I'm speaking, so there you go. Um, I wanted to share today, um, we're gonna be talking about the Inclusive Classroom Profile. Um, it's something that I feel has some real value to be looked at as a tool to be using and rating inclusive preschool classroom quality. Um, there's a lot of other ways you can use it, so I'm going to share that with you. Uh, just last week, I spent four days in North Carolina because I have nothing else to do, and I went to the TOT to become trainer of trainers. There's only three people right now in the United States that are reliable raters to be a trainers, and so they have figured out that they need to train a few more people, so I was selected. So I'm very honored, um, and I'm wearing purple because we all wore purple that were being rated, the three new ladies that were being um, reliable rated for training. Anyway, so welcome. I'm glad you're all here. Um, do we have folks from preschool here? Raise your hand. Hooray! We've got Head Start, State Preschool. We have um, any district preschool? Okay, good. And all you virtual people, feel free to send in any questions or comments on the chat line, and we will be answering questions at the end. So um, as you can see, purple's the color. Inclusive Classroom Profile, um, and we're gonna be talking about how to use it to determine quality. So thank you all for being here. And I'm checking my time, and I'm still within my range. That's good. Uh, so moving forward. Hmm. <laughs> um, I am obviously with the Inclusion Collaborative, and you're at the state conference, and this will be recorded so then everyone can watch it for a long time. Isn't that fun? And apparently my clicker is not working, so that's going to be annoying. Um, we today we're going to go ahead and uh, learn a little bit more about the Inclusion Collaborative. And if you need to know more, we have a website. You can always call us. We'd love to talk to you on the phone. I want to give you an overview of the Inclusive Classroom Profile, talk to you about what we've done. Um, we've actually been working with the Inclusion Classroom Profile since 2015, before it was even published. So I'm growing older with the inclusive classroom profile, I like to say. And then I want you to really think about how could, how could you actually utilize these, um, uh, some ideas here to bring back to your sites and be uh, useful training for your um, sites. So at any rate, uh, the Inclusion Collaborative is all about welcoming and belonging. Does everyone feel like they're welcome today? That is a huge tenant, guiding principle of mine that everyone should feel welcome, uh, that you all belong. And so whenever you're training or working with people, that's something you should always try to model because it's that parallel process. If adults feel like they're welcome, the kids will watch you and they'll feel welcome. And we also know that when you are feeling welcome and that you belong to a group, you actually engage your learning brain and then you learn more. Isn't that amazing? Um, a short story about myself, I was an, a child who went to 10 different schools and I was about this tall in fifth grade. No, I'm just kidding. Well, I was probably about this tall. So I know how it is. My father's in the military, so we moved every couple years. And so I just know how it is not to feel like you belong. And so that's really made me conscious of trying to make sure everyone belongs. So that's a really important um, aspect of the Inclusion Collaborative. The Inclusion Collaborative, as you know, um, the why of what we do is um, to make sure that all individuals regardless of abilities and disabilities, do feel uh, like they have access to quality, um, inclusive learning environments and community environments. This is our mission and our vision. You can look at that later. And we do a lot of, um, obviously, trainings, because here's our fifth annual conference. Um, we do lots of small trainings for districts. We do large trainings for community agencies. Um, we do make and takes, which we will get started again doing. We also support the teaching pyramid, which many, um, will I'll be sharing that with my presentation today, how that really aligns well with the inclusive classroom profile. We do coaching and technical assistance, and pretty much there's oceans of opportunities for inclusive work right now in the state of California. This is our website. Um, we really like to make sure that 
people know about the mailing list, you can click onto the mailing list there, and then you will get notifications um, when things come out. We have a Facebook. We don't do newsletters anymore. No one reads them. So we do Facebook, short little clips, and I think we're going to have some fun Facebook um, entries for this conference that we've had. We have a Pinterest. Has anyone heard of our Pinterest site? The Pinterest site is really booming in the fall because teachers are constantly going to it and then adding stuff to it. It's got great ideas for adaptations and modifications. Um, and then we have our YouTube channel, which you can go here and um, click on there and see past trainings. Um, we have some PSAs. There's a lot of good resources um, on our YouTube. So I encourage folks to use that. You can go quickly right here and click all those if you want to. So I want to make sure everyone knows about our website. Uh, we have an inclusion support warm line. Uh, we actually have a funder, uh, Charmaine Warmanhoven, who has been funding us for 13 years. Can you believe that? Um, and she helps support this, so it's free of charge for folks. Um, and this is a support line that anyone can call. It's free, um, but it provides developmental supports. Um, we can do some ASQ trainings for you. We can send referrals out resources for you. We have a lot of e-packets of different disabilities that people might have questions about. And we also have a whole library of social stories. Does everyone know what a social story is? It's the best. Social stories help us get through our life. And we're thinking next year we're going to write a social story for our conference. Isn't that a great idea? Um, but a lot of times we don't have time to um, write a social story ourselves, so we have a library of about 500. You can call, what we have two uh, support staff that uh, man this. One's in English speaking and the other one's Spanish speaking. Well, she's English speaking too. And we can send you um, your social stories that you might need and then you can pop those kids that need that social story um, into, your, into the book. So it's an easy, great, handy, convenient resource for you. Um, so, how do we know that we have quality inclusion? Is, is how, I mean, quite honestly, how do we know if we're providing good inclusive practices? And so there really has been no tool to actually look at this, um, and that's why I'm so delighted um, to be able to share about the inclusive classroom profile. They actually found in a couple studies in the late 2000s that um, young children with disabilities can experience low quality in classes that are otherwise rated as high quality. So we have our rating system, the QRS, um, and Santa Clara County has Quality Matters. Um, and they did find that children who have disabilities may not be experiencing the high quality that a uh, high quality uh, program um, is rated as if they have disabilities. So that was why it's really important to have some measures to be able to look at the quality indicators for quality for students with disabilities. So that's what the inclusive classroom profile was developed for. It is a reliable instrument to rate inclusive settings for preschoolers. Um, and as I said, I was just in North Carolina and I got to go to different sites in North Carolina. It was so cool um, and become reliable rated. Um, the background, you can go to this link right here. Um, there's over 10 years of different studies that Dr. Sukaku, Elena Sukaku, Elena Sukaku has developed. By the way, I invited her to come to the, um, pre the, the conference this year because we actually spoke together last year at an institute and um, she's speaking right now, although it's three hours later, at DEC on the ICP. Isn't that great? Um, she's actually speaking with the Georgia folks that I spoke with at the, um, we did a joint um, joint presentation at the uh, QRS build in San Diego. So she's in Georgia, or speaking with Georgia in Florida, and so we're here today. Um, anyway, she did a whole bunch of uh, data and studies and analysis, and you can see the background on it, on that link, and it shows what the different studies were. Um, the inclusive classroom profile then, it actually was about 12 years in the making. Um, and in 2015, when we first started our journey with ICP in Santa Clara County, it hadn't even been published yet. We were using the, the draft version. It, um, she's done studies, um, reliable rating studies in uh, the UK. She's working in Australia right now. She just came back from India. So this is something that's being looked at worldwide. Um, the inclusive classroom profile is designed then to complement existing classrooms, measures, and standards. It's not instead of, it complements. 
and it focuses on the classroom level uh, practices that support the individual needs of students with disabilities. Classroom levels. So we often say, what does that mean? <laughs> um, so there's three different ways that has been this has been used um, so far. Obviously, as a research tool, Dr. Sukaku has been using it for a while, a long while on research. Uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill has been doing research with the Frank Portogram. Um, and so research has been a big part of it. Um, but they've also used it as program evaluation to go in and do a baseline and see what we need for potentially supporting quality improvement, which could be setting up your uh, professional development team and coaching supports that might be needed to support inclusion. Um, so the, those are the main three reasons that it's been developed. Um, there's uh, Central Mississippi, I believe, is uh, um, working on a preschool um, special, special um, needs cr um, credential, and they use the 12 items of the ICP as the basis for their, um, their interventions and their training for their credentialing program. So it was interesting hearing about that. Um, the ratings indicate the extent to which adults, they look at the adult interaction um, and how they adapt the classroom's environments, activities, and instructional supports so that um, kids can have access and active participation in the group. Um, and they adjust, make little different adjustments between child to child as needed. So there's a lot of very specified um, classroom level adult practices that you have to look for. So who's being observed? Who gets observed? You guys know? Has anyone ever done ICP? I know, Annie, you've had some experience with it. It's actually, we are watching the adults. <laughs> so I like to say, we're watching all the adults. They go, really, me? Yes, you're being watched. Um, so what we do is we will identify, there has to be at least one child with an IEP in the classroom. Um, and that's the minimum requirement for being an ICP classroom rated, getting rated. Um, and then what we do is we look at that specific child. We actually looked at up to three children when we're doing the training. Um, and so that's one way we can determine reliability if you're able to watch two different kids, three different kids, and all the interactions that they're doing. It's exhausting, but it's really worth it. Um, but what you do is you watch the children identified with special needs in the context of what they do every day in their classroom and their social activities and their peer interactions and their adult interactions and how the adults support that peer interactions. Um, so we're looking at teachers, co-teachers, specialists, paraeducators. Um, in our first um, uh, pilot study we did in 2016, we found classes that had substitutes did not score as high because they did not have that relationship piece with kids. It's really interesting. So just some nice correlations there. So understanding the structure of the ICP, has anyone done an Eckers? Sound familiar? Seven point scale. Um, so it's, it's set up very similar to Eckers, so you don't feel like you're trying to whole, learn a whole new thing. There are 12 items, which we're gonna talk about. Uh, there are different indicators. So it's rated as a one, two, three, one, three, five, and seven, and then in between. Um, and that's very similar to Eckers. There are examples. The word and and or is very important. <laughs> the words many and several, majority, you have to know all those definitions. And then the criteria, criteria for rating indicators is on that um, other side. That when you see something, then you have to really think about the criteria for it. But the whole idea is that you get a rating that is reliable so that if somewhere, someone else would be in the same room at the same time, they would be getting a very similar score. And that's what reliable rating is all about. So it is a one to seven point scale. And then the, as I said, the ratings indicate um, the extent to which adults, adults are being watched, um, adapt to the, the classroom's environment, activities, instructional support, um, in ways that encourage that access and active participation for all kids. But specifically, we're watching the kids with the IEPs, okay? So what does it measure? Um, it looks at specific instructional strategies. There's looking at scaffolding, 
Uh, there's looking at modeling, there's looking at, so there's, you do look for specific um, strategies that support the individualized learning and engagement. Engagement's big, right? Um, for in, uh, activities and routines. You look at um, procedures that monitor children's learning and progress. And there's environmental adaptations. You look for those to see that they're in place to help support um, access and participation in activities and routines. One of the items is, is there a visual schedule at eye level? And you have to see it. Check, then you can do it. You have to look for different tools or supports within the classroom to um, support social emotional learning. So we always go through the books and look at that. We look at are there posters? Is there a feelings chart? Does this sound familiar like teaching pyramid? <gasps> it's amazing, it all goes together. Um, but you have to have actual um, documented evidence that it's there. So what do they measure? Um, again, I said you have to know a lot of words and be specific about it. Was the practice implemented? How well was the practice implemented? Did you see it once or did you see it two or more times? So we actually have to tally. Reciprocal feedback back and forth. You know what, you have to be really on your game to get up to six of those. <laughs> so that's what they look for. Frequency, how often is it implemented? The context, where was the practice embedded? Do you see it inside and outside? And we have found it's really interesting. Um, in our second pilot study, we had folks um, that did great inside with their interactions and support of children's social interactions, and then they went outside. Woo, it was a free for all, and none of the adults talked to the kids. So it's an it, that was a really eye-opening thing for them because they thought, oh, we scored really high, and then they went outside. <laughs> um, intensity, what's the level of scaffolding? Can you actually see the layers that go into it, and how is that teacher supporting that child's needs? Um, and then consistency. Is it consistently being supported by different staff through the day? So what was interesting is when we um, did a, one of our pilot, the first pilot study, when there was a pullout service, our inclusion child left, we didn't have any observations. So is that inclusive education if they're not in the room? It's just interesting because it really you know, showed in that score how hello they have to be in the classroom. So anyways, it's all good stuff. So who can use the ICP? Raise your hand, everybody. You all want to use it, right? Teachers, program administrators, uh, researchers, pr especially professional development, um, early childhood specialists, um, state assessors. It can be used by anyone. Um, it's a good idea to have an overview training so you know what you're looking for. And then to get reliable is ideal, but a lot of intensive work. So, how many items are there? Does anyone remember? I'm, I'm listening, virtual audience. See, we have to remember we have a virtual audience. There are 12 different items. Isn't he a cute guy? Um, and as I said, one of the, uh, an institution in um, Mississippi is using it as their um, different items for their credentialing um, um, objectives. So here they are, the 12 areas of inclusive practice. Um, and do I need to read all those for you? We're gonna go through and you'll see pictures of them. So there's 12, and remember it's looking at adults, and it's also looking at the child with the IEP. So adaptations of space, materials, and equipment. Um, in general, inclusive classrooms are pretty good at this. We know that there has to be materials at eye level, kids have to have access, Having the visual labels on every um, center area is actually a really supportive way to get a higher score in this item. Um, adults help organize the environment and set it up so that kids have ease of use. Um, and then adults need to show that they're helping kids to use materials in creative and purposeful ways. So that's adaptations of space, materials, and equipment. And in general, that's a pretty easy one. Not easy, but it's a highly, um, typically a higher scored area because Inclusive practices, a lot of people know we gotta make our stuff adaptable, adaptable and available for the child. Uh, adult intervention, in, uh, adult involvement in peer interactions. This can be harder, and it has some very specific language in it on how you can meet the scores here, but adults need to notice and support peer interactions. Um, and ex again, I mentioned that when we have a substitute, she was not as familiar with the kids and didn't interact with them. 
We actually had another um, uh, fun story where the raider was out raiding one of the preschool classrooms and the adult was on their cell phone at the sandbox. So what happens when you're on your cell phone? You don't, ad you don't have in interactions with the kids. So it's just kind of interesting to see how these practices make an impact. Um, and adults helping children to initiate and sustain relationships. A lot of kids with IEPs and children with disabilities may need some supports in how to reach out and interact and make connections. And that's something that they, this measures how well adults do that. This one's not always scored high, I'm just telling you. Uh, adults' guidance of children's play. Um, children are given choice in play. Um, within their play, they have choices, which um, sometimes we don't always see. Um, and adults encourage and scaffold individual play and social activities with other kids. That's a big one. And you can see this little guy. He's got his little friend next to him, and they're doing their thing there and that adult is helping to support and make that happen. But these are the kind of things that this um, item will measure to make sure that you're getting kids to interact with each other, okay? And I have, a, I have some video samples to show you. Uh, conflict resolution, it's amazing how many classes you go to and there are no conflict re conflicts to be had when you're rating. I'm just telling you, it's very common. <laughs> um, and the conflict resolution when you're rating it, you need to uh, make sure that everyone saw that conflict and you agree on what that conflict was and then you rate it before you all together in your team when you're doing it. Um, but I have to tell you, when we came in, the kids were like, no one's having conflicts. It was very interesting. Um, so this, show, this is measures how does an adult respond to conflict between kids with disabilities and their classmates? Are there tools being supported? Uh, for example, a solution kit being, you know, pulled out and used and talked about when kids are um, working on a conflict would really um, increase that um, rating right there. Okay. Membership. This is really important, and we talked about welcoming and belonging. We want to make sure that um, it can be actually measured in the classroom, that kids, um, f you can tangibly see that there are, there's membership in place, and it promotes that social climate that nurtures individual differences, um, and it, you really need to look for a system that shows that all classes are, all kids are part of that classroom, um, so having different uh, pictures of art on the room of all the kids. Um, another thing you look for is social responsibilities. Do all the kids have a social responsibility or is it only one child who's very capable and always takes care of things that does it? Um, so you have to have a system that shows that it's a rotating and that different children are have access and are available to be um, having social responsibility. So that's a good one. And then there's looking at adult-child social interactions, and this is the one where you go back and forth and have to keep track of sustainable reciprocal. So it focuses on the nature and frequency of interactions between adults and children with disabilities. And again, they'll look at back and forth and back and forth. They also measure whether it looks like you have that feeling of they enjoy each other. Like the, the adult is actually finding out more about that child and having more convers deeper conversation. So um, that's a, it's a fun one to watch. Support for communication. And um, this is really looking at are there tangible things in the environment that help the child to be able to communicate. Um, so adult support for communication. So she's gesturing right there. You have visual icons. You might have some signing going on. Um, and that there's f strategies that facilitate um, language and communication with each other. Even having a turn-taking back and forth icon um, would help with communication for those kids that need that. So that is support for communication. A choice board maybe, um, that they can pick their activity that they want. So you have to have some tangible um, uh, things in the environment in place. And this is looking at the group activities. Is every child despite different abilities, able to participate. Um, so encouraging and um, engagement and participation of children within the group activities, that you've planned the group activities so that all kids are engaged. Um, we had a really great um, 
video clip, and I'm not sure if I have it in this one, um, of a little boy who is in a wheelchair and they were doing a circle time activity in the lobby of the school and he was having a hard time getting out. So he actually stood on the, um, the teacher's feet and was part of the group with the big parachute going round and round. And that was a, just a really beautiful way that he would be able to be part of that and um, using the teacher's feet. Isn't that great? <laughs> Transitioning. We all know transitions are fun, aren't they? Um, we were thinking it'd be fun to have um, Quick to the Batmobile as one of our transitions for our conference, but we didn't quite get to that. Um, transitions, this is a time that can be challenging and um, making sure that it looks like it's intentionally planned, there's things in place for it, the pace is good, the nature of it is um, available and all kids are um, understanding it, that you have some tangible things to help with um, Transitions, a song, uh, the you know the timer, the the transition sign that you get a child to walk around with, say we're going to be cleaning up. Um, so you need to make sure you have some tangible evidence of transitions. And we all know that transitions can be difficult, and so this is a whole um, item because um, as we know, transitions can take over your world, right? Yes, you guys all know that. So it's a really important aspect of inclusive um, quality. Feedback. This is really important, and again, this is one that you keep track of tallies, um, that you can see that adults have provided um, supportive feedback, not just a good job, or a th even a thumbs up, you can count, right? Mm -hmm. High five counts. Um, acknowledge the efforts and accomplishments, um, and offer feedback for promoting learning and specific skills, that there is that feedback for the child, and that's a really important aspect of inclusive preschool. Um, then there's actually some tangible things that you have to find and observe and touch um, to get um, credit for family professional partnerships. There actually has to be um, policies and practices for communicating with families of children with disabilities. You need to have a parent handbook that actually has an inclusive policy in it and say something about children with abilities, disabilities in it. Um, we had one site that they had a parent policy. And it was online, but no one could find it. And it was like seven days later and they finally found it in their main office so we couldn't give them credit. Do you know what I mean? So it has to be something that you have to be able to see and touch. Um, and we also um, look for evidence of progress monitoring, that there is a system in place so that every three, four weeks you can see the progress on the targeted IEP goals. You actually have to see the IEP. You don't take a picture of it because it's all confidential, but we need to know that the preschool classroom has access to the IEP. You also measure that the um, pre a preschool staff person goes to the IEP meetings, um, and that's one of the specific interview questions also. Um, and then this was the monitoring children's learning that I already mentioned, S making sure you have tools in place um, for monitoring. Um, I forgot to mention with the family communications, there has to be a tangible evidence that you have that back and forth by, by um, communications with families, an email or a notebook or some kind of um, method of communicating with families. But also within that, communicating with families about what's going on with their children's learning. Um, so this is another one that you have to tangibly look at the tools um, and see that they are in place and that there's a system for them. And I was at, when I was in North Carolina, the site that we were at, their um, screening first first beginning of the year assessment wasn't due until November, so there was nothing. <laughs> so it's interesting, it's like eight weeks into school, there was still no documentation. So that's a common theme, just something to think about. Um, so administration of the ICP, how are we doing in time? Good. Um, it's a really a three part. Um, there's an observation which is usually about two and a half to three hours long. So we recommend that you go in with not a lot of fluids in your body, you know what I mean? That you um, don't have your cell phone on and you have to be kind of in the back and be able to observe and watch the child uh, that you're observing. Um, then there's an interview portion where the teacher needs to be interviewed and there's specific questions to ask. Um, and then there's the document review portion. So when you interview, you say, you know, we'd like to see your parent policy, we're gonna need to see your progress monitoring, and you make it as convenient as possible. And you already know the questions, so you don't take up a lot of this poor person's time. Sometimes with the interview, they're giving up their lunch, they come in a little bit early, you know, they're already stressed out, so the, the goal of the ICP is to make sure it's as comfortable as possible, 
so that they'll have you back again, for one thing, um, but to, so that they're actually getting something out of it. Um, so you need to really plan for about three hours, um, and you need at least a, a hefty 20-minute um, chunk of time with the teacher. So it's a really good idea when you come to the site to ask, you know, to be the ICP rating, have, have it happen, that you've already spoken with the administrator and the administrator is understanding of this, because oftentimes the administrator will be in the room, so they're in ratio. Well, you can have time with the teacher. So that's the mechanics of it. Any questions? Not yet? Yes, ma'am. Wait. Uh, um, I just have to repeat back because we have, so virtual people, we're asking a question. Mm -hmm. We will talk about that because it's only out of the University of North Carolina with Brooks Publishing right now. And they just last week had um, three people from, Rhode, one from Rhode Island, one from Wisconsin, and one from California, who, which was me, um, go do a trainer of trainers. And then we have to be mentored, so we'll talk about that. It, it's kind of like building the airplane as we fly. That's the way it seems to be my life, another pilot. Um, at any rate, the inclusive classroom profile, I'm gonna share what we did in Santa Clara County, because it's been a very fun journey to um, see how it all works um, and get people excited about it. Um, so in uh, 2015 is when we had our first um, trainers, reliable raters were trained, and in 2016 is when we had our first pilot study. Um, concurrently in August 2016 is when it was published. So before I used to walk around with the draft, and then I started walking around with my accessory, the ICP. And since I go to First Five a lot, I would always have it. I'm just telling you, that's the way you do it. Um, and so in 2000, the, so in the fall of, uh, spring of 2015, we had a, a half day overview and we had three reliable raters trained. I was one of them. And then we did a pilot study in January 2016, January through May. And we did um, a total of 12 classrooms. And um, we did an ICP rating, a pre-rating. Then we had some professional development. And then we did a post-rating. And I'll explain that study in a minute. And then in 2018, we said, we're not done. We're still around. I kept carrying this around with me. Huh. And um, we were able to get some funding with First Five again to help support this project. And we had six reliable raters get trained in November 2017. And I think, Annie, you came up for that. We had a half-day overview, and then we had six trainers trained. So we had two-thirds of the University of North Carolina folks in California <gasps> in one week. Isn't that crazy? Um, and we had 18 classrooms participate with us, and I'll get into this study later. Um, we had a pre and a post with uh, professional learning communities in between, and then we um, did sev we awarded 17 out of 18 um, QRIS sites were inclusion endorsed. And what is inclusion endorsement? I will get into that. So I'm gonna keep moving forward. So this is our 2000, well it started 15, but we finished it in 16. And we had a partnership with uh, Frank Porter Graham, because remember they weren't published yet. Um, and First Five helped supported uh, getting the training out. And we did a total of 12 classrooms um, that were self-review only. We had a couple of those. We had a couple groups that were self-review and, and observation. And then we had those that were observation only by reliable rater observation, by the way. Um, and we could, because we really wanted to see how effective would this tool be to just give to a site to say, here you go, this is gonna help you. Um, so it was interesting finding out our results. Um, oh, here's our timeline. We had in 2015, June of 2015, we had our training and three reliable raters trained. We had our overview project ribbon cutting in January 2016. Remember, it was still draft at this point. It wasn't even published. Um, we had the initial ICP observation and self-review in January. We had a professional learning community. We had support from staff. We really, um, this, this um, pilot study, we involved the coaches that were on site because they had coaches then, and then we don't have as many coaches anymore, but I'll get into that. So they were an integral part of making sure that um, ICP was supported. And in May, April, May, we had our final observation and self-review. 
Um, I'm not sure how many of you know, but in Santa Clara County, there's a s Head Start can end early some years. So all of a sudden with our pilot study, we had Head Start ending like May 3rd. Ah, so we had to quickly get them done. And you know what April is, right? Vacation weeks. So it gets really exciting to do these. Um, in May, we had our final professional learning community, and then we made our final recommendations to first five. So basically what we found was, this is code for all the classrooms. You don't need to know who they are. You can see the blue are pre-scores pre and the red are post-scores. So they increased overall, which was really good. We had some days, like here was a substitute. Oops, didn't help their rating that day. Um, there was another classroom. This is the day they had pull out and then they decided not to pull out the next time. So people figured out what, you know, we have people that know how to get scores, right? Um, so what we found out overall though is that it was really helpful to say, you know, part of quality indicator for preschool inclusion is to have a policy. And so a lot of sites did not have a policy and then they added it after this. Um, we did find ICP scores increased, which was great. Um, we did find that when people self-rated, they rated themselves higher. Oops. Um, so that was an um, interesting finding of this. And so when we did our next pilot, we took that into consideration. We also found that the ICP scores increased when the classrooms had had CSUFL teaching pyramid training. And what's interesting since that time, because we do teaching pyramids so we know who the classrooms are, but since that time we found out that that's nationally what they find, that the teapot that assesses teaching pyramid practices correlates pretty high with the ICP. So it's interesting. And I'll share what about another instance in our second pilot. Things that got in the way of um, happy high ICP scores um, are substitute staff, as I mentioned, and pullout services. Another classroom um, that we've been working on trying to get more inclusive time. They are fairly um, moderate to severe kiddos that go only go over half an hour at a time to the Head Start program, and their scores weren't very high either because the kid's only there for 30 minutes. So that's another push for, uh, hello, let's keep them in the classroom the whole time. Um, so what we found is with the ICP 2016, we also did um, a lot of state preschools that had really high risk kiddos in them and that these practices, the teachers felt really benefited all their kids. Surprise, I know. Um, we found there was a lot better co uh, collaboration with teachers. They had to talk about it, get on the same page, and it really increased that awareness of inclusive practices. So that was um, pretty much what we found out from the 2016 pilot study and then in August they, pr they published, yay! So, um, with this pilot, we, dis we developed an action plan, which um, I'm not sure if um, they're using anywhere else, but this is what we developed so that we looked at the target indicators and then folks could pick out what target indicators that they would like to work on um, and an action plan. And this seemed to be the key thing to really keep people grounded and you could look at that every month and see where you were and what you wanted to change. And the coaches helped support this in this first um, pilot. So we, what we found at the end of 2016 pilot is that we um, could create a crosswalk of complementary globi global rating tools of all those different uh, measures that, were, that are out there. Um, we wanted to train programs, coaches, and raters on the ICP and the crosswalk. We recommended I overview ICP training for all QRIS participants, um, creating video exemplars of good practices and creating ongoing PLCs. And then our goal is to try to incorporate ICP rating into the QRIS rating system. We have lofty goals. So that was 2016. So as I mentioned, I walked around, it got published and it was pretty in purple and then I carried it around with me wherever I went. Um, and we uh, got some more funding from First Five. Um, we actually had some educator effectiveness funds. I don't know if any of you are county office folks that's since gone, but we were able to get the training, um, half, half of it paid through that in the county office, and then First Five matched it. Um, and so the partnership for the ICP pilot project in 2018, we expanded it. We wanted six instead of three, because our first original three, the only one around still was 
me? And I have, don't have time for this. No, that's not true. But at any rate, what we did was we decided to um, have first five pick three p people they would like to have rated, and then the uh, Inclusion Collaborative picked three people that we would like to have rated. So we had a consultant that does the teaching pyramid get rated. We had one of our inclusion training staff get rated. And we had a Head Start coach who's now a teacher get rated, which was great. And then first five, um, they had uh, one of their consultants do it. And then we picked two partnering um, districts, Franklin McKinley and Alum Rock, and chose um, folks, two of their teachers, one's a coordinator, um, so that we could have a nice uh, broader picture within the county of different people who were reliable rated. So remember, there's only three people in the United States who do this. <laughs> so it's not an easy process. Every two years, you have to get re-reliable rated. And you have to go to North Carolina to do it. So you can see there's a few challenges with the logistics. But we got six rated. They all passed with flying colors. We had two folks come from the Frank Porter Graham. And we had to go through the Brooks um, Publishing um, Company who now owns the ICP and works with the author and North Carolina. Um, and so it was a three-part contract with three people. Talk about exciting. No one had ever done it. So this was our timeline for 2018. Um, we had our training November 13th through 17th, a half a day. Um, we had it at first five, which is great. And then we had six reliable raters get trained. So to be reliable raters, you have to actually take a group of three. They go no more than three with the raider. They go out to a classroom. You have to be quiet as little mice and keep your little eyes on and not get distracted. And you are in a classroom. You have to go to an inclusive classroom where they have at least one child with an IEP. So it has to all be prearranged, and you have to get passes and get cleared to go on campuses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's not easy, but it, it can be done. Um, we chose 18 QRIS um, sites this year with First Five, um, giving us a list of QRIS sites that have a rating of a four or five. So they were already fairly high quality. Um, we had three reli six reliable raters, and each rater had three different sites. And we tried to match them up with folks that they kind of knew already. And um, the, the North Carolina team wasn't really thrilled with that because they thought it might get in the way of reliability. So we're going to change that again the next time we do it. Um, but it was a lot easier for someone to come in when it was someone they knew. There's something about being rated that's so scary. <laughs> So we wanted to make, just let them know it's a pilot and we're just here to support. Um, in March, uh, so in February, they had their ICP pre-rating and ICP action plan was done with each site. Each rater then did a met with the admin and the teachers afterwards to do a debrief and then um, complete an ICP action plan. And then in April and in March and April and in May, we had um, two hour PLC meetings where we go over the ICP and talk about it. And um, we actually use video exemplars to help with training. Um, and we met at first five. And then we did our post rating in May. And then we had another final wrap up and meeting. And this, all the sites that scored at least a five on the ICP received inclusion endorsement from Quality Matters. And Quality Matters is the name of our QRAS in our county. Um, we chose inclusion endorsement because Georgia Department of Ed, that's what they do. So it's like a little extra rating. Um, some states are doing extra points, extra stars. Um, we thought an inclusion endorsement sounded nice, don't you think? Everyone got a certificate. We had seven Head Start classes get in inclusion endorsed. Um, so that's what we did. And um, what we did was recommend the sites to receive the inclusion endorsement, and that's the badge that, we, yes, we made up. Um, and um, posted on a, the first five website, which I think we're still working on, and we want it on our website, and we're still working on that too. Um, and then um, we want to make sure we still show up wearing our ICP, because we'd like to continue doing this project to incorporate the ICP into the Quality Matters in um, Santa Clara County. Each county, each ICP, um, or each county Quality Matters in our county, you can have certain local things that you can add on to. So um, First Five is still very interested in doing this, so we're doing it again. These are our reliable raters, so you can see we had a, a really great group of different folks. Yep, Marcella's on it. I got Marcella to do it. Um, nice representation. 
we made them take a picture. You know, that's always fun. They all got certificates. Got to make sure you let everyone be acknowledged for all the hard work they do. And these were the different sites that participated in our um, first, in the 2018 pilot. Um, we had three different sites from Alum Rock um, who have a Cadango partnership for Head Start. So it was interesting to work with a community-based Head Start and a Santa Clara County Head Start. Um, we had a Campbell Union D School District. We had three of their sites. They want to do all their sites this year. They are um, a sliding scale um, um, fee for service, but they have state preschool um, contracts. So they're a very blended model. Um, and they were wonderful. Um, we did California Young World, which is a private nonprofit in Sunnyvale. They've been partnering more with Sunnyvale School District, so that's been exciting to see that go. And then Franklin McKinley, as you can see, we had three different classrooms, and we had a representative from their district also trained. Um, and they, at, at our Educare site, anyone heard of Educare? It's exciting. Anyways, we have an Educare. They have a beautiful, inclusive classroom prof uh, inclusive uh, classrooms there. Um, and they partner with the Santa Clara County Head Start along with McKinley and Wool Creek sites. We worked with Milpitas Unified Schools District. They had just started in the fall a new um, preschool inclusion CDC. Um, and then we worked with Mountain View Wisman, who've been doing it for a while, Castro and Therikoff. Again, they have blended, they partner with their special ed and they have state preschool funds with some district funding. We actually had San Jose Unified School District, um, Alma Den, CDC, who this year has become an inclusive classroom. And so this was very helpful for those teachers. And then we had um, Head Start classrooms and Darling, which is um, partners with our Santa Clara County Office of Ed SPED, which has higher uh, involved kiddos in them, the moderate to severe. Chandler Trip School, which has the children with vision and orthopedic impairments. And then we had Rolu Head Start participate. And then we also worked with um, Sunnyvale em Elementary School, which again has a state preschool uh, funded um, sites. So it was a very um, collaborative group of folks, let me tell you. And so what we did was um, we had three monthly meetings after school. Um, we encouraged the admin to come. Um, and the team consisted of the admin and a general ed and a special ed teacher. Um, some of the sites sent everyone. Some of the sites sent no one. <laughs> so it was a varied thing. Um, the teams, we had them sit with their reliable rater, so they felt like a little family. Um, and they reviewed, discussed, and updated their steps for the next action plan, and we built in our, our PLC to have time to look at it and what they needed to do. And here's what really worked. We had video clips that demonstrated specific actions um, with team discussions after. So one of my staff is a brilliant photographer on the side. Is that amazing? And she um, is also um, working with uh, the Inclusion Collaborative to do the Embedded Instruction Pilot Project. Has anyone heard of that? Okay, it's through University of Cal uh, Florida and CDC CDE, California Department of Ed. Believe it or not, if you take children's targeted goals and embed them into their day, <gasps> they actually make really good gains. So there's practice-based coaching with it, and it's a very, um, it's a research-based project, so that every, th like, three hours of video, and we have to send it to University of Florida, and they tag how many times you see interactions. So she's in classrooms a lot and she is able to catch ICP inclusive um, items happening. So that was so great. They got so excited about coming every time so that they could see if they were being shared. So that was a really, I felt a really good way for teams to get positive feedback because we all know what PDAs are, positive descriptive acknowledgements. If you go to a training and there they are showing your classroom and its wonderfulness, it was really exciting. So by the end, we were like having 40 people come every w every you know month for two hours. Isn't that amazing? But that was kind of the ingredient, I think, that really motivated people to be excited about this project. So again, um, we had action plans. Um, in this um, pr uh, pilot, the membership, supports for communication and feedback were the three main areas folks wanted to target and work on. And I'm going to show you an example. Are you guys ready? This is, um, a, it's, a, it's at Wall Creek, but it's a mod to severe uh, preschool inclusion class for kids with autism. 
So they're really working on communication, right? So I just want you to see what you see in here. Okay. 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 Now it's Alexander's oh, turn. Alexander's turn. Yeah. 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 Thank you for waiting, yeah. Alexander. Okay. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. 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 Achilles turn. Achilles turn. Come on. Achilles. What's coming out? Can you guess? You need to wait to see. There you go. Aliana's waiting. Why? Hey, that's, that's okay. okay. That's okay. That's okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah, come on, Ken. Ken, you ever turn? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Give it to Ken. Turn. Thank you for waiting, waiting. Okay. Alexander. Mm -hmm. Alexander's back to We're waiting. waiting. Right? Jaden okay. will take. So, what did you see there? The support communication. I personally want my own little yellow weight card. <laughs> when I go to adult meetings, wait. So you also saw the icon that she had, and they repeated waiting. Do you see that little girl go, she didn't have an IEP, but she was looking at it like waiting. She was just doing literacy. I mean, it was like, there's so much going on in there. Did you see anything else that supported communication? There was a lot of really nice peer sub peer um, discussions that were being supported. Anything else? The teacher acknowledged it. That's feedback. So do you see? What the more you look at these, and the more you know the ICP, you could probably write a couple different items in this one. But we get it. We gave it cre credit for supporting communication because that has that yellow weight card. So at any rate, so that's just an example that we found really worked with our um, our pilot study this year to be able to have these examples like this. This is another one of adults' guidance of play, and yes, it's at ed Educare. No, I think it's well. We'll, we'll figure out where it is. See there. These are your friends that are putting the trucks behind me. Do you want to race with them? Yeah, with the fire truck. With the fire truck? Okay. Draw the finish line. Okay, here's the finish line. Okay, on your mark, get set.
play. And a lot of times outside, what happens? A lot of my bikes is really, really common. So anyone can play that one. Um, this was an actual conflict that happened. You don't always get conflicts when you get later, so it's kind of fun to see one. Um, and I just wanted to share this with you. Um, it's very cute. Well, we're going to fight over the solution kit. OK, calm down. Guess what? We have another one. So Livy, why don't you take this one? Anthony, come on over here. Grab that one, and then together we'll look through it, OK? I this one. OK, bring it back over here to the blocks. OK, I know what we can do. I know what we can do. Ask a teacher. Nah, Anthony says no. So you both want to play with the blocks that Livy's building with, right, Anthony? What about this one? What's this one? Play together. Play together. Do you think that that would be a good idea? Yeah. To play together? Yeah, let's play together. Ask Livy if that's okay. That's okay. That's okay? Well, I want to see what you guys can do together. Oh, Anthony. Wow, you guys feel as a team. Team work. Make sure you build it strong. Paxton, you want to help? That's not over there. Yeah, Paxton. Would you like to help them? Yeah. Go help them. Teamwork. Yeah, teamwork. Right. Osman is right. Teamwork. that little guy in the end who was just kind of observing, what does he say? Do you want to play? And she said it again. Do you want to play? <laughs> and he thought, yeah, I do. So she, she was able to get him engaged with that play. And so that would be adults guiding to play right there. But not only that, she did some scaffolding. She did a lot of repeating. Um, she labeled what they were doing. There was quite a bit of things that she did in there to in support that play the social um, engagement of each child. So we don't know who had the IEP, but I suspect it was a teacher observer on the side. Okay, so is, are you still excited about this? <laughs> so what we found in our 2018 pre and post rating um, by item is that every item increased. We had one site, um, the Campbell Union School District, they had been taught on teaching pyramid strategies. They'd had all new staff. They were reminded when we went out there and one of the classrooms increased by 92% overall because they got their teaching pyramid stuff out <laughs> and they put their visuals on the wall and they used their solution kits. So it's amazing that sometimes a tool like this can help, oh yeah, we've got these resources that we should be using. But if you look across the board, orange was higher. Isn't that great? So it made me feel like we were actually doing something. Um, this was uh, taking an average score, and that's how we um, figured out the increase in endorsement. You had to have at least a five. So you can see the average pre-score was 4.87 at the beginning. And at the end, they went to 6.08. But I think a lot of it is that they had come to these trainings, they had supported each other as a team, they had their action plan, they had the relationship with the reliable rater, 
and many of them had their um, admin there with them. So overall, each site increased their score by 1.21 points. Yeah. Yes, they were all QRIS uh, four or fives to start with. Okay, good question. Because we want it to be an extra like an endorsement. So what we found was that 17 out of the 18 sites um, were rated five or higher. I'm not gonna say who didn't get rated, but we did know that the people who did not attend any of the PLCs did not get endorsed. I'm just saying. Um, so it was pretty exciting to see that 17 out of 18 got more than five at the end of this um, pilot study. Um, and the sites who attended all three PLCs did really well. And that they came with their site supervisor and if they had a coach and a strong team. So these were the inclusion endorsed quality matter sites that um, received a fire five or higher. Um, so you can see it's a variety of groups again. We had, that, we had a lot of Head Start, we had District, we had some private, um, we had a lot of blended, um, but it was really impressive what they did. So now I have people asking, can they do it again? <laughs> or they wanna do more sites. So 2019's upon us. Um, we have actually agreed to do another pilot study with uh, First Five, um, so we can get 18 more sites, um, QRIS, four or fives. Um, get them pre-rated, do some training, and then hopefully get some more inclusion endorsement. Um, we want to make sure we've added inclusion endorsement as an additional QRIS um, rating in Santa Clara County. So I keep going to those meetings with my accessories. Um, and then the reliable trainer of trainers, since having reliable raters is critical. Um, there was an opportunity to go to North Carolina last week, and so that's part of um, what our contract is, that I get this... Um, mentorship finished and then I can go out and do more reliable rating and then we'll have more inclusion endorsed sites so whew, lots of questions I'm sure um, Tiffany would you mind Tiffany's my room monitor would you mind checking to see if there's any um, questions that have been written down on the chat and then if you have questions you can write them on the, the papers, but I'll take yours right now. There's some um, cards, index cards on your table, um, but we have a question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to talk to Brooks Publishing. So Carolyn Burke, Brooks Publishing. They have a whole ICP website. You can go to Brooks. They have lots and lots of resources on that. They've done a great job of beefing that up and getting more resources. Um, they are w looking at doing some online, more online trainings. Uh, the University of North Carolina actually has a couple modules that are online and they are free. You could actually do those. Um, I, I'm hoping that I get to my mentorship in, April, in January because they have a site that really wants it and that then we could get out and get more. Where are you from? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. We could make it a hub po project. And hubs have money. Well, that's the rumor. <laughs> OK, any other questions while you're sitting here thinking? Anyone know online? Thank you. Joy has a question. Yes, it's an add-on. It's an add-on. So what the department, what Georgia has done has made it like an add-on extra so that um, different sites can get acknowledgement for having inclusion endorsement. Also, families would like to know who's been inclusion endorsed. There are also, if you think about it, how many of you do funding? If you think about it, you know, IDEA says preschool LRE has to be offered. And if you don't have any quality sites in your district? Are you just gonna give money away to something? So a lot of people don't, they, they worry about where kids are going to get inclusion preschool experience and if it's part of their IEP or not. So wouldn't it be nice to know that those sites have been endorsed? 
So I see that as another really nice mechanism. Um, since our pilot, we've had like Campbell wants to get more of their on, Alan Rock wants to do, Franklin McKinley, more of their sites um, to be endorsed and all the Head Start want to be inclusion endorsed also. So I think it's coming. It's, again, it takes forever to do it. There are folks in San Francisco who have done um, inclusive classroom profile training and become reliable rated. Um, there's a pocket of folks down in um, Orange County who have been doing it. Um, so if anyone wants to collaborate on this statewide, then call me. I, we need to make this happen. I think Chime would be a good site. Yeah, You've got your school, dis your college right there. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Renee. Is the, Is the crosswalk available? Brooks has it on their site. And so we were going to do that, and then um, Brooks started doing it. So yeah, there are different crosswalks. You can email me if you, and I can find what I have, but it's also on the Brooks website. Tiffany has an online chat question. So the question is, people are wondering, is there a nice similar tool for K-12? Um, what we've been using is inclusive um, checklist by Dr. Rich Villa, um, and that's one of my favorites. Has anyone used that in this room? We, in fact, have done a lot of Inclusion 101. It's got a lot of checklists in there that you can do self-assessment um, on different categories that um, support. Uh, Rich Villa was here two years ago, three years ago, maybe three years ago. If you look on our YouTube, you can watch him over and over and over again. Um, but that inclusion checklist has been wonderful. We've, we've done multiple trainings on it, and um, districts have been using that to assess where they are in their inclusion journey. Questions? You use that one too? Good. It's my favorite. Okay. Mm hmm It's perfect. Gets you start thinking, especially if you can get it up to the admins who, hmm, you say your inclusion. That's what's so interesting about inclusion. There's so much, um, so many definitions out there of what it is, and the reason I like the ICP is that it's tangible. There's um, tangible evidence that you have to show that is in place and have, um, when you're doing reliable rating, it's like, going to court to say, you know, I saw six, and these were the, you have to back up everything you see. But it is tangible, which a lot of us, what is inclusion? That's really the first question you have to ask when you're, you're starting this journey. Any other questions? I'm going to have her start again because this is good. And it is a theme. So what I'm seeing a lot is because I'm a teacher on special assignment, so I have the time to go out and do these different vet checklists and different for like procedures that we're using. And our behaviorists are going out and doing this. But what we're seeing is our special education classes are not inclusive. They're not using visual icons. They're not having any icons for transitions, they don't have any procedure for transitions and things are not as well planned out. So they'll have a free play area with nothing and the teachers are not promoting these inclusions. So we're trying to get even our special education classes to be more inclusive. Any solutions? That's a good comment. I have to mic myself. Thank you. That's a little too close. Um, this has actually been used in our, we have a teacher preparation program that we um, teach uh, inclusive education and this has been used in a lot of the teacher prep program that we are training and um, we have students go out and actually do their inclusion are you getting me Anthony he's good isn't he um, so this is a mechanism you can use for it I think more and more um, institutions are starting to realize that they really need to be looking at inclusion education and what it is um, and again the districts and the LEAs are going to need to go back and train folks who are currently working in it um, to meet uh, the needs of the kids there. You can use it everywhere, pretty much. Okay, any other questions? Okay, the gift of time. Thank you, everybody. You can turn me off now, Anthony. <laughs>